a moment, you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I have a very special episode today. The one, the only Marine J. St. Germain is the founder of the Ascension Institute Mystery School near Sedona, Arizona, with Branches, Transformational Enterprises Incorporated, and Akashic Records International, Inc., an internationally recognized teacher and intuitive. She is also the author, musician, and producer of more than 15 guided meditation CDs. She's the author of seven books, including Waking Up in 5D and Opening the Akashic Records, she lives near Sedona and offers workshops, workshops, and she covers a lot of the very fascinating um, concepts and ideas that we discuss on the channel, including our transition in to the new earth and the Merkaba light vehicle and the Akashic record. And I really consider Maureen uh, an amazing writer, and she's elucidated on subjects that are kind of complex, but really opened up my understanding of them. And so... I was excited to finally get a chance to talk to her. Welcome to the Reality Revolution, Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for having me. It's a real pleasure. So I'd love to go back and, and just get an idea of sort of your origin story. You, you've written some books. Primarily, the focus of most of those is about ascension and raising our level of consciousness, but really in some very subtle detail about what we have to expect in the new 5D world that's coming. Obviously, you were inspired by this, and you had some experiences in the past that brought you to this point. Tell me a little bit more about your story and, and what inspired you to get to this point. I think I was born awake when I was a little girl, um, when my mother hid the beautiful Lives of the Saint book that was covered with gold foil and gold edges. I'm sure she didn't want a little seven-year-old playing with it, and I actually, when it wasn't in the bookcase where I expected it to be, thinking of books, right? I um, I just asked, where is the book? And I was shown, I could see where it was. And I got a chair, went in the high shelf inside a closet, got it out, did my reading, and then put it back in the bookcase to tell my mother silently, um, don't hide it from me because I'll find it. <laughs> and so that. I think, as I said, I was born awake. So I've always been interested in spirituality. I was raised Catholic, very devout Catholic. When I was 11, I couldn't find a name for my confirmation name until I came across the name of St. Germain. So I took that name as a as confirmation name very early on. Um, I have always been interested in spirituality and mysticism, and I wanted to grow my wisdom. And so I came upon the material called the Merkaba, as taught by Drumbalo Melchizedek, and I was one of his early teachers. And I taught this work in over 24 countries all over the world. Um, and so I became pretty well known for that work. And then the sacred geometry work, uh, I figured out a way to manifest using sacred geometry, which is very amazing. Um, and then the Merkaba work led me to the Ascension work because I've always felt that the Merkaba was a fifth dimensional vehicle. And I believe the fifth dimension expression is the same as the ascension. And when people would say to me, well, you know, give me a simple version of what 5D is. I would say, well, you know, it's like what all the other churches teach us is heaven. That's 5D. And that makes it easy for people to understand. The other thing that is a big aha is when we become fifth dimensional, we can slide back down into third and then we are fifth dimensional, and then we slide back down. And the way to remember this, this will help people remember, is teenagers do this. First, they do something brilliant, mature, evolved. And the next day, they do something stupid. And we think to ourselves, oh, that's so wonderful. They're so grown up until the next thing. And that's us. That's us. We evolve slowly on a sine wave. And the more we focus on what we are choosing, the easier it is to express at that level. What I mean by this is, you know, in the book, Waking Up in 5D, uh, I talk about language choices. And, you know, everybody does this, including me. And we say, I have to. I um, I have to get this report done. I have to pick up the kids. 
And in truth, that that saying of that phrase creates a power distance between me and some outside authority. When I say, I, I'm picking up my kids now, I'm leaving, I'm taking responsibility for my actions. When I say I have to, it implies there's an outside authority and we're giving our power away inadvertently. So one of the number one phrases to kind of unhook from is I have to, and to start to develop other ways of expressing your need, your desire, your wish, and I still practice it. Every once in a while, my husband will say, you have to. And <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, you know, so we play with that. <clears throat> so um, the books on Ascension are really practical guides on what is happening and how it's happening and why it's happening. And more importantly, how can you navigate this process? You know, I was called the practical mystic enough times that it's stuck. And I like to think that the way I help people is through looking at the spiritual knowledge that's coming through me and putting it to work in a, in a um, practical way. What, what really appeals to me about the Merkaba um, teaching from Dronvalo Melchizedek is that it appeals to the to my masculine side that needs that detailed oriented idea of how my light body works so that I can focus on it. Um, as he points out that, that, you know, there is the way to awaken the light vehicle from the feminine side from your heart where you don't need to be as specific. But there's that part of me that I need to know how it spins and what way it spins and I need to visualize it and see it. Have you encountered this dynamic and why the, it, oh, the, yes. the, the, it appeals? Oh, yes. <laughs> now, fortunately for me, I was a math whiz as a kid. So, you know, I could have slept through algebra class and still pulled straight A's. Um, I uh, have a big love of the numbers and the mathematics and the geometry. So I have, over the years, had many classes where there were more many more men than women or all men and you know no women and i even had a phd uh, physicist tell me if if i had learned math and the understanding of irrational numbers and fractions the way you teach it i would have understood this in a much better way this is better than anything i've ever learned so one of the ways that i help people understand is I allow this information to become alive. And my uh, guidance has been to find logical ways to help us because we in the West, both men and women are used to expected to operate in a logical way. And I remember asking my higher self, I'm looking for a logical reason to always follow your higher self. And I meditated on it for a couple of years. And one day laying on the grass, on the ground, I got it. And I thought it was so funny that I burst out laughing. So here's the setup. Um, you're watching something on a network station that knows where you're at. So maybe it's the Kansas City station or it's the Chicago station. And there's a big hailstorm that's predicted that wasn't in the weather report in the morning. It just, you know, flash flood or flash hailstorm. So they interrupt regular programming to tell you there's a hailstorm coming in your area. Take cover, move your cars, whatever. That's the logical reason to follow your higher self because your higher self has all the data you need and it's situation normal with an update. Mm -hmm. So that's the logical reason to follow your higher self. Because if you got a weather report that said it's a hailstorm and your car is on the street, you're going to find a garage to pull it into or a carport to get it out of the, the harm's way. So, and then the whole business of connecting with your higher self is very powerful. And I developed a way a logical way for people to connect with their higher self um, and get 100% accuracy after six weeks. I, you know, I spell it out, I give you the regs, and all you have to do is follow the steps. And in that time frame, it happens. It's astounding. It's amazing. As I, as I have learned to communicate with my higher self, 
it has become more and more clear that the, my higher self is me and is me in far in the future and has additional knowledge about the possible different realities that are available and, and my choices. Um, it took me a long time to reach that point. Uh, I'm going to so stop you and say it's not a version of you in the future. It is you, a more highly evolved version of you that you are learning to connect with. It doesn't have to be in the future because technically the future and the past don't exist anyway. Within yeah. the 3D understanding of time. It's the linear understanding. The, this the is linear very understanding male. of time. <laughs> the higher self is from the future. But what we truly know about time is that it's all existing in the same moment. Um, See, but, I would never agree with that. I think your higher self is alive and living in you and accessible to you right here, right now. It's not a future you. Yes, I agree. You, but I'm wait, accessing. Wait, wait, let me get it out. Sure. You as a human are becoming the higher self. Yes. It's not the other way around. You are becoming it. It's not becoming you, but it's there for you to move into. Right. But it has experienced many of the things I'm going through and it has carries that linear understanding of time. So I don't want to go into that car. I might be in an accident. My higher self kind of warns me, Hey, you don't get, don't even like car today. Maybe not. That's, that's my higher self communicating with me because when my higher self got in the car, it didn't work out for him or her or whatever the gender of my higher self would be. That's what I'm trying to get at. I understand the concept of non-linear time but that's what i the, the more and more that's why as a i find great benefit from communicating with my higher self because my higher self knows what's going to happen it has a knowledge of the future or the possible futures the, available the, to this me. is where i will challenge you again because okay. in 5d there is no time to limit your accessibility see when you refer to your higher self as some version of you in the future it implies that things are always happening in a sequential circumstance and and we already know that that's not true from science we know that sometimes something happens here that's happening somewhere else in the world simultaneously and they're connected so how can there be a future if if it's all happening at once right. and and it's really important in in the linear concept to know with absolute certainty that your higher self is is a evolved version of you but it didn't take time to become the evolved version of you. You put on blinders to come play in the 3D world, not the other way around. Right. So with, with my Merkaba, as I, you know, when I first started doing, I do it every day. Then eventually, uh, you know, I do it once a week, but it's I'm always aware of it a little bit every day. How often That's... after you've been doing it, should you continue doing the, the, the full... Well, Mercado I exercise. love your explanation because that's exactly how I tell people that if you know it's permanent, because you're always you're always aware of it. It's like when you have a pet, mm -hmm. you're always aware that the pet's at home alone. And at some point you want to get home and get them food and water and walk them. So <clears throat> um, when you have a co constant awareness, it's in the back of your mind. It's not running front and center that's when your Merkaba is permanent. And once it's permanent, technically you don't need to do it every day. But I will tell you that my higher self told me every day for an additional eight years after it was permanent to continue to do it. And I did every single day. And I still do the Merkaba pretty regularly, but not every day. Once it becomes permanent, it's not required. When I asked my higher self, well, now that it's permanent, do I still need to do uh, the Merkaba? And my higher self said, that's not the right question for you, Maureen. And so then I thought about it for a minute and said, okay, do I need to keep doing it? Yes. Okay, now that I've agreed to keep doing it, is my Merkaba permanent? Yes. Because you and I, if we knew the Merkaba was permanent, we might stop doing it. Well, it's permanent. What do I need to do? You know, it's like some people, when they get married, they think, okay, good, we're married. I don't have to work at our relationship. I won her heart. I won his heart. We're good. And that's not how it works. You know, it's right. like this big wake up call. Oh my gosh, I got to get oil in the car. Why? I was, uh, I encountered an article when researching the Merkaba. Uh, maybe you, you've encountered where uh, there's a sort of uh, opposition 
to the way that Melchizedek or Drumbalo teaches the Merkaba, saying that he's spinning it the wrong way and it has a really negative and terrible um, result if you follow these practices. It created a tiny bit of fear until I read about it more. I was wondering if you were aware of these outside discussions that say, oh, what the way they're teaching the Merkaba, it's all wrong. It's very, very dangerous. You should be careful. Have you heard those thoughts and, and do you have any responses to that? Well, remember, I taught this all over the world for right. ongoing every weekend for about 15 years. Um, and I will say what we're talking about for the sake of the audience is the shape, mm -hmm. the star tetrahedron that you turn on. Everybody has the shape around their body. But when you activate the Merkaba, you're actually spinning it. And what Scott or Brian is referring to is the fact that you're spinning it in one direction and another to a certain code that's a match for your um, body. Now, there are people who are teaching codes that are from the Kabbalah. And while those numbers from the Kabbalah are very, very sacred, they are not safe for the Merkaba. So you want to use the codes that were provided for this activation. And the codes are based upon the phi ratio, which the human body is built on. And it's based on the speed of light, the speed of any atom and electron, electron within the atom rather. And those are codes that are anchored to here. And once you've turned on here, then you can go anywhere. So I appreciate uh, there's a, you know, there's anytime there's something really good out there, there can also be some pretty heavy duty opposition. But the original 17 breath Merkaba mm -hmm. is very, very special. And my uh, clientele have come to me and have said that they find it easier to do and learn because it's very step-by-step, -step, as you have described, very precise and specific and how you activate and what it could look like or what it should look like. I will say, once you're spinning it, you and I can't see it because it's spinning so fast, but we can hope to intend that it's moving the way it's supposed to. And then we use our imagination. The amazing thing about your books is that you take it to another level. And I always suspected as I started doing these meditations, there, there are other geometries that go beyond just the Merkaba. And finally, in your book, you identified that there are these other sacred geometries that we're attaching and connecting to. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Please tell me more about how you became aware of this and, and more about those outside sacred geometries that go beyond the Merkaba. Okay, so the original 17 breath Merkaba would be the basis. Mm -hmm. And I encourage everybody to learn it. It takes a few hours to learn it and then five minutes to do every day. So even a busy mom can find time to activate her Merkaba. Now, the number one thing that happens when you activate your Merkaba is your life changes in a very powerful, good way. You are able to process and understand the reality around you in a more evolved way, which allows you to be more loving and more patient and more compassionate. And the number one proof of that is when I would have these classes of all men, I would get calls from the wife, you know, a few weeks later and saying, I want what he got because my husband has changed so much since your workshop because his heart has opened. Now, the additional geometries are the 5D Merkaba, which is a higher version of the original Merkaba, where you are now activating a field that's like a hourglass, and you are in the lower half. This is where your higher self or your um, higher self is, but it's also where you move your heart chakra to, so that you have this much bigger system with higher geometries. And then there's a new one coming out, the 8D Merkaba which takes even a more evolved approach using wow. the Icasa dodecahedron. This is a icosahedron and a dodecahedron that are nested perfectly. And the way they're nested perfectly is they are in phi to each other. Mm -hmm. So this phi ratio is very important. And the phi ratio is a very powerful tool that shows the relationship of bones in the body. And if you have the ability to let me go in my closet, I'll pull my measuring uh, calipers to show people. Would that work? Sure. All right, cool. 
So magically, I have the calipers in my hand. And what this does is measures the phi ratio. And the phi ratio is 1.618, but it's based on a fraction. The golden and what ratio, it means, right? yeah, a ratio right. or a fraction. And this is, the, if this is one, then this is 1.618. If this is one, this is phi. So um, we can hold it up to my little finger and the base of my wrist. And you will see that it makes a perfect, I don't know if you can see this division. Mm -hmm. If I hold it against my sweater here. Yeah, I can see it. You can it. see that. And then if I expand it and I measure my entire uh, hand as one, then it takes, it takes us to my elbow. Okay. And you can do that with the feet. You can do this with every bone in your body. And what it means to you when you have that experience is that the phi ratio is found in plants. It's found in the human body and the bones. It's found in the DNA. It's found in the relationship between the sun and Venus and uh, the earth. And so you find phi everywhere in both organic and inorganic matter. So I like to call it source code. Phi being so important, it allows us to understand how we evolve in the reality. You won't get change unless you have this important relationship. And to kind of help understand this, I often talk about the relationship that most people understand called pi, where you have a radius. As long as you know the radius, you can know the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, or you can know the area of a circle, pi r squared. And we memorized this when we were in fifth grade, but we often forget. But those of you who are architects or artists, you know, you know these uh, configurations. When we activate the Merkaba, we are accessing the power that is found within this set of ratios. And what's so interesting is the Fibonacci sequence, which is highly touted, produces the phi ratio on the ninth and 10th iteration. But what a lot of people don't know is the Phoenix sequence produces phi no matter where you start. So you could start with eight and 64, add those two together and get 72, and then 72 and 64, and you add those together. And on the ninth and 10th iteration, that pair produces phi, 1.618. So you can go play. You can have a parlor game with your friends and say, I want to play this trick with you. Pick any number. You pick another number. And you start adding them together and you keep track. How many times have you added? And on the ninth and 10th, get out your calculator and, and don't tell me the answer. I'll tell you. It's so much fun. It's so exciting that you have, we found a way to integrate this amazing part of our reality because the the golden ratio the fibonacci sequence is one of the most amazing things about the universe something so simple and that to be able to add it into my own ascension practices it just fits so perfectly it makes so much sense it's like That's god is winking to us with every flower in every single number right? exactly it's a treasure map it's a treasure map to show us where the answer key is it's amazing so uh, you have so many really amazing books, and, and I'm never going to be able to cover all the cool stuff that you talk about in these books. So a couple of concepts that you talk about in Mastering Your 5D Self and in Waking Up in 5D is the concept of other versions of you that we have. Oh, yeah. Other versions of, of oh. right, the, both amazing. Um, you know, I, I discuss, uh, you know, parallel realities, multiple, a multiversal reality sort of existence. Uh, I'd love to get your ex explanation in using the Merkaba and your tools that you teach in exploring other versions of the self. Okay, so I had I started having these experiences where I was encountering the kind of coincidence was that was bigger and more like spiritual than even a normal coincidence might be. And so I started asking my guides what was going on. And they told me and showed me that these were other versions of me or other versions of people I knew. 
And so I began to track all this and it was an amazing discovery. So for example, I had two men who were both born in um, a major city in Japan and had emigrated to the US. One man lived in Seattle, the other man lived in New York. One man was the tall Japanese type and the other one was the petite Japanese type. And they both had taken Akash, uh, the uh, Merkaba course with me, and they both decided to go to Egypt with me on that particular trip. And I was going regularly once a year, so they could have picked any year, but they both picked the same year. So I decided to put Yoshi with the other man uh, it, together as roommates. And I was told by my guides that these two men were the same soul, but two different versions of themselves. So as a spiritual teacher, I don't tell people stuff. I let them right. discover it. And then I get to confirm it for them. It's much more powerful if you have an experience and I say, oh yes, everybody gets this you know, purple blue light when they see their higher self. Or a lot of people get that. That's more validating than if I tell you ahead of time and you're looking for the purple blue light and you don't see it. So these two men on the trip come to me and say, you know, that teaching about other versions of yourself, we know we're, we discovered we are other versions of each other. And then there was a story of two Marys. One was in New York, one was in Miami, and they were both Hispanic. Um, they were so similar that the staff got them mixed up and they thought it was one person making two appointments. We finally got that sorted out. And the first Mary was her husband had just taken a job in Miami and she was terrified to move because all her family was in New York. And so I asked my guides, am I to introduce them? And my higher self said, yes. Now, one of the things that I have found with other versions of you is that they show up to give you a nudge or a leg up or to help you in some way on an, in an area that you are very interested in um, to, you know, give you that extra push that you need to get a book written or to get an idea across or to get an invention handled. And one day, one of my students approached a well-known author, um, um, the man who wrote the book, Return of the Revolutionaries. And he's a medical doctor and she had heard him lecture in Seattle. And so she approached him after the lecture and said, one of the people that I study with has said that there could be multiple versions of the same person. And I'd like your take on it. And of course, this man has written books on people like Martha Washington, George Washington, all the revolutionaries who come back in, into life today mm -hmm. and are here to help the mastermind, the, the next generation of of uh, mastery that we're moving into. And he said, oh yeah, I totally get that. And let me tell you my story. And he proceeds to tell the story of how he was giving a lecture in uh, Hong Kong and a man from India approached him. This man was also a medical doctor and they had an instant liking for each other. They felt like they knew each other. They went to dinner and they started discussing their careers. And sure enough, one uh, Ida area that the first doctor had kind of set aside to pursue this very specialized interest in, you know, the return of the revolutionaries, the other doctor from India had taken it up. And so my irreverent story about this is that you meet for coffee in the sky once a month. You want to take the Hawaii gig. You want to take the um, uh, Hong Kong job. Do you want to write about this subject? I'll cover the other thing. Isn't that fun? It's so much fun. How many how many selves do you think we normally have? Is it always a, think, a fixed number or is it can it be variable? Oh, it can be variable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, each person probably has at least three. Some people have six and some very evolved souls have maybe 20 or more. And they're not all the same age. You know, you'd think they would have the same age. They have some things in common. Like one of the people that I worked with had, I say one, but, you know, two of the men had the same birthday. And when I asked them, uh, I asked one of the men, well, this man was a medical doctor. 
And so I said, well, what's your interest in engineering? He said, oh, that was my undergraduate degree. On the other hand, the, the first man that had the same birth date, he, um, he was an engineer type. He had not gone to college, but he'd invented a bunch of, of, of devices and tools for his industry. And um, he always wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he got to be a doctor, but in another body. Right. And what was even funnier is I said, did you ever take a job in Hawaii? Because I knew the first man had. And he said, well, I interviewed, but I decided not to take it. <laughs> the other guy got it. <laughs> it. You know, you can start asking questions and you see all these validations. Yeah. It's amazing. The next question, another cool thing that you said in one of your books is that at this point in our shift into the new earth, there's no more karma. There's all this discussion of karma. We're done with that no more karma. Tell me more about how you got to that and what that means. Do I need to be worried about my past lives and all the terrible things <laughs> I've done? Or is, can I let that go? You can let it go. All right. So what happened to me is my guides came in in 1995 and said there was no more karma. And I was astounded. And I kept checking in with my guides and kept saying, are you sure there's no more karma? You know, I was, a, I really was like in shock mm -hmm. and certainly I didn't understand it. I do now, but I didn't understand it then. And so um, I thought, well, let me try it on some of my students. And I had a couple of women who were devout Buddhists, wonderful people, good friends had studied with me. It didn't land well. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. So they, you know, how can this be? And I, I honestly <laughs> said, I don't know. I haven't sorted it out myself, but I know it's so. So as time went on, I began to understand we are changing games. We're no longer in the keeping score game. We're in a different game that you don't keep score. Think of some of the games you might play with children that you don't have to keep score, a guessing game, even kids that play Monopoly don't necessarily keep score, especially if they're quite young, you know, 10 and that age group, they, they don't need to keep score. They're just happy to have the time to play. So <clears throat> one day when I was teaching in Hong Kong, um, I was channeling the, um, I think it was the, the Lord Sana Kumara. And he was trying to explain to them what was meant by no more karma. And he, he gave this beautiful lecture, which is in the book. But one of the most compelling parts of it is a statement that I've kind of memorized. And it goes like this. The game is over. The game will end when there are no more players. Will you be the first to leave or the last? So that means the only way to end the game is to stop keeping score. So I can't wait for you to stop keeping score. I got to do it for me. And what that also means is I, I'm, I might not judge you, but what about the judging I do of me? You know, and, and, and we all do at least one of those two. And many of us do both, you know, and you don't think you're judging. And one time when I asked my own guides, you know, well, um, what's holding me back? What, what else can I do to pay attention to wh whether I'm judging or not? And they, told me to pay attention when I was driving. And of course, when I'm driving, when I was driving, I was driving in San Diego. So kind of picture that traffic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people were either not awake or inconsiderate, you know, they'd pull in front of you, they race around you, you know, do goofy stuff. And I used to be mad about that. I used to say, well, that guy's an idiot. Why would he do that? You know, I would make some, maybe not mean comments, but certainly judgmental comments. And so I decided I would need to, and this is where the advice comes in, I would need to make up a story around every driver that did something wacky that I would find funny. And then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be annoyed anymore. I would be in, <laughs> in, entertained. So that's what I did. You know, that guy must be in a bigger hurry than me. And I'm calling the angels to help him get where he needs to go. Um, that's an old lady. She probably needs help driving. Let's call on the dragons to help her drive. Because <laughs> it was always something sweet and supportive. And it changed my attitude. But there has always been this sort of, uh, we are facing the consequences of our karma. And on top of that, uh, that we, we are constantly dealing with karma in, in this life, that it's a natural part of cause and effect. 
Um, so it's imprisoned us. There's this idea that it's imprisoned us in 3D. And it, uh, there's a point eventually, if we are moving through a natural transition, um, that the game starts over. The scoreboard, That's right. And we're no the longer in prison. Is zero, zero, and we're no longer in that prison of the karma. We learned exactly. our lessons from it. We uh, you... we learned our lessons from over, uh, you know, time in, in the linear time idea over a long period or many lives concurrently. That's right. That's right. exactly right. And that's the key that we have been in a prison, a prison with a game that sometimes is enjoyable and sometimes isn't. And we're moving to a place where the possibility of things that are hurtful or harmful will not exist. What that means is, you know, somebody comes to your house and they're an unexpected guest, but they're welcome. Somebody you know, you, you're you so so happy to see them. You invite them in, you offer them something to drink. You ask them to sit down, you sit down and talk to them. You wouldn't think of standing there with the door open and just talking. <clears throat> so in a way, when we move from 3D to 5D, our natural tendency to criticize is gone. Our natural tendency to find fault doesn't occur to us. And that's one of the ways you know you're in 5D is that you only see goodness, you only see love, you only see kindness. And even when you are treated badly by somebody else, maybe you have a, a waitress that doesn't do her job or a waiter that's out to lunch when he's supposed to be serving you lunch. Um, I always joke around and say, just give them a bigger tip. They probably need it. That may help them step out of the funk they're in. Who knows? Right. So, and think of how much fun that is. I mean, you know, you don't have to go overboard. You can manage in your budget. If the wait, wait staff was really good, what would you do? And then do that as a signal to the person, not that they deserve it, but that they have an opportunity to be it without right. deserving it. And that's exactly what you just said. This movement from cause and effect is changing. And it doesn't mean cause and effect the same as karma, which is you did something to someone and now you're having it done to you. And instead it says you did something to somebody else and you are concerned for their welfare. So in a plane, you're walking down the aisle and you trip. Mm -hmm. That person is asleep with their legs out in the aisle and you didn't see that and you trip. So instead of the person in the seat saying, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, they could just as easily say, are you okay? And when my kids were little, I taught them to say, are you okay? So instead of saying, I'm sorry right away, you say, okay. Now think about this. How many times have you seen a mom or a dad tell their child, say you're sorry? Say you're sorry. And the child is digging in their heels and digging in their heels. I'm not doing, I'm not doing it, you know, and there's this big battle. But if you said to your child, ask if they're okay, that puts power here and it puts power there and it makes it equal. The reason a child resists the I'm sorry is because it puts the other child above them and they don't want that. They didn't intend that. They want to be equal to the child that they accidentally caused a harm to. Right. And that's how you solve it. So in the book, I actually tell people, stop saying, I'm sorry. And that's hard to do. And you certainly wouldn't do it in what I would call a broad-based environment just yet. But you can certainly start doing it at home and say, look, you don't have to say you're sorry. Just tell me how things are going to be different. Tell me you're concerned about how I feel. You know, and sometimes when when my partner says, are you okay? I'll just kind of, no, <laughs> I'm mad, I'm hurt you know, whatever. And that lets me speak without yelling at them for what they did. It lets me express without blaming, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. It moves out of this seesaw that we get ourselves in when you are keeping score. I consider myself like a bibliophile. I love to read like uh, about the new earth and 5D from different authors. And it's sometimes disconcerting. There's so many different interpretations. This is how it's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. Dolores Canson so says something. Uh, Dramvalo Melchizedek in his book, Flower of Life, has this very frightening chapter 
where we go through these three days of darkness and these the balls of energy show up and and and, and every you know all, everything starts melting down and electronic stuff working uh then i've read some that say oh that was going to happen but we've stopped it i would love to get your interpretation of what's going to happen and how we can work with these different assessments from different authors about the transition to 5d well for a long time my guides were showing me that that there was like a meltdown point where people would you know go to the streets and be ready to riot and you know be angry for what was happening. And then over the years, I could see that lessening. And at a certain point, they showed me that they had solved it. And I didn't know what the solution was at the time. I, I will tell you what I speculate. But what they showed me is that the biggest concern was the emoting. And the excessive emoting would actually make things worse than if there was a gradual adjustment that people made. So what I believe is happening, and I've always said this, that it would be a gradual transformation and that there might be one or two, I'll call them significant events, but they don't drive the change in humanity. The change is coming because people are waking up and deciding, choosing to demand a better life, demand a better life for themselves and for their children. And in so doing, they are treating each other better. You know, I, I, you know, when, when all this business about um, uh, the race stuff came to the fore, I wondered if that wasn't somebody pushing for an agenda, because my experience with people of all races and all genders was very positive. And even with strangers, you know, and, and I find myself that, you know, this differences aren't there in real time. People come up to you and smile and say, hello. I've had strangers stop me and say, I dropped my glove or or whatever. So part of what we're hearing in the media and experiencing on videos isn't really so. It just isn't so. And when we know in our hearts that we love our neighbor and we don't have to like everything they do, but we love them and allow them the space to be who they need to be, we create a movement away from judgment. And that's where we're headed. And it's kind of funny because I like to say, you know, everybody's going to be 5D whether they're ready or not. I do see a battle going on as people ascend uh, because everyone's ascending. But for some, it's uh, it's they only have a desire to enable for themselves. So they will manipulate and use the light for themselves. And they see everybody else as an instrument. And then others see the self in others. And mm -hmm. they they have this greater level of empathy. I see a greater level of empathy. And I see this sort of conflict between these two positions, the serving the self and the serving others that is part of this transition. Mm -hmm. What does your guides tell you about that? Um, service to self is important, but mm -hmm. not the main dance. So you must empower yourself. You must love yourself enough that you could love your neighbor. Because if you don't love yourself, it's nearly impossible to love your neighbor. If you have been given hatred as a child, you have to work through that so that you can be loving to others. And where we're going is a balance of male-female energy. Where we are going is a balance of knowing and understanding and being so plugged in that we don't see an action that would be harmful or hurtful or selfish. When I was talking before about how you would treat a guest as they come to your home, you wouldn't think of not doing something for them. That's 5D. 
somebody who has no training is not aware of the customs in America. Maybe they're from some foreign land where they don't do that sort of thing. They might not know to not stand at the door, but to invite them in. The person on the other side might think that's rude, but in 5D, the option of standing at the door and doing nothing doesn't occur to you. The only option is invite them in, possibly invite them to sit, possibly invite them for a meal, possibly offer them something to drink. So what happens is the possibility of no or not, the possibility of choosing the not God choice, as I like to call it, doesn't exist. And that's what's different in 5D. So we have plenty of choice, but the choices are limited in that they're all choices that take you higher, all choices that are loving, all choices that make it easier to be your most evolved self. The other interesting thing that you write about that I know people have encountered, especially in my group, is uh, the ascension energies on a daily basis that we experience. Uh, I was excited when you said, hey, if you have to get up and go to the bathroom at night, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a bladder problem. It, you know, your guides are are, are waking you up or, or changing your energies. So uh, people are experiencing and writing about, hey, I'm, I'm feeling these energies today and these constant shifts in energy. So tell me more about your experience. Since you wrote about that, people are experiencing ascension energies all the time, shifting and changing our body and the environment around us. Mm -hmm. And we have real actual things that go on with us temporarily as we do, correct? That's right. That's right. One of the first things that people were complaining about is I can't keep my eyes open. And my response is, well, you know, if you're self-employed or you work at home, go take a nap. Take a 20 minute nap and get it out of your system. And it's very often because you have guides that are trying to upgrade you or give you something that that's the opportune moment and you take it. And, you know, this business of getting up in the middle of the night, it could be one of the things that I noticed is that um, um, I was waking up and many of my, my people were waking up and laying in bed and thinking, why am I awake? And then they would feel this download of energy. And the, the way I experience a download is this energy being stepped down. And I'm going to play, be playful here and make a sound to show you, um, like from a movie set, what it might have, if it had a sound. It doesn't have a sound. But if it had a sound, it would be do, 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 do. And you'd feel this energy moving in. And the waking you up is you giving permission to take that. You've already agreed on inner levels. Well, let's wake her up, make sure she knows. And even when you don't really know what's going on, you're awake enough to accept it and then go right back to sleep. It's it's amazing. And there's so much more. We we could have talked about the Akashic record and and it's how it's waking up, but and and so many other amazing things that you talk about. Everybody can check out uh, your website, which is saintstgermainmysteryschool.com. And you have some really exciting events coming up. Uh, you have a cruise on March 17th and 18th, a Sedona Ascension Retreat on, uh, or the cruise is on April 7th through the 14th. You have a, a, a Sedona Ascension Retreat on March 17th and 18th, and another retreat on May 19th through the 21st. We'll have uh, some links and descriptions uh, that you can find under this video. And so there's amazing opportunities to meet and learn more from Maureen. And thank you for taking this time. I know you're very busy. It's been an honor to talk with you and, and to share your knowledge with my group. Thank you so much. And, my pleasure. Uh, and what fun talking about the Merkaba. I love that stuff. So <laughs> you do too. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And welcome to the Reality Revolution. We return you now to your local announcement.